Uh, you know, you start thinking about the things we do that aren't necessarily old fashioned. So you try to change things up and what we're going to sing and all that. And uh, I got, I've already got Miss Kimberly Dean that was here this morning. She's going to sing our special for us. And uh, that ought to get some people here by itself. She did a fantastic job last week. And uh, I think it's going to fit just right. I'm trying to talk her husband into playing banjo with us that day. But uh, we'll see. I don't know if we've got to talk him into it or not. But, uh, we're going to have a good time. I gotta, uh, I've got to find some overalls from somewhere. But uh, I don't know any really short people that I can borrow any from. So anyway, I may have to cut some off. <clears throat> anyway, let's sing a couple more. We'll get over to the deal. Yeah, from, from the bottom of the top. All right, let's sing page 138 at Calvary. Here's a spinning vanity and pride, caring not for those crucified. Thank you. 
And Jonah starts to learn it. It's pointless to run from God. Yahweh is a God who relentlessly pursues. And so, so Jonah makes this plea, throw me into the sea and it's going to stop. And, and you know, they resist, but finally they just they throw him in and, and the storm stops instantly. And then what I love about this story is, is it's, it's about God pursuing Jonah, but you kind of see this collateral damage, right? These pagans all of a sudden start praying and worshiping the one true God. And isn't, that, isn't that just awesome? Isn't that awesome to see that God's pursuing Jonah? Jonah's being disobedient. And through that, you see these other men come to knowledge of God. And they start worshiping God. I mean, isn't, isn't this sort of the gospel story? In Jonah chapter 1, I mean, we, we run. God pursues. I mean, wouldn't we all say God has gone to great lengths to bring us to Himself? So great a lengths that He sent His Son to die in our place. Yahweh is a God who relentlessly pursues. second truth I want you to see tonight is that Yahweh is a God who miraculously saves. So they throw Him into the sea, right? And it says in verse 17 of chapter 1, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Three days and three nights. And it says, Jonah prayed to the Lord from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord in my distress, and He answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me, and your waves and your billows passed over me. Then He said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head and roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed up on me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. My, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation <laughs> belongs to the Lord. Yahweh is a God who miraculously saves. Now, would anybody in here disagree with the fact that Jonah deserved to die? Jonah kind of got what was coming to him when they threw him over into the end of the sea. He wanted to be away from the presence of God. And all of a sudden, he absolutely was away from the presence of God. Near death. But God miraculously saves him by pointing a great fish to swallow him up. Preserve him for three days. And he praises God with this Thanksgiving song for miraculously saving him. With his salvation. And he acknowledged that God was good. And if you look at this, there's a lot of parallels. And it's funny that, that, that Billy and I were just talking about parallels between the Old and the New Testament. And, and this is a great parallel that we see in Matthew and Luke. It's, it's the sign of Christ. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so shall I be in the the belly or the heart of the earth, right? Amen. You know, uh, it's important that we see that, that Jonah's preservation was just as much uh, a miracle as, as Christ. This was a miracle that God performed. And, and we, we find ourselves sometimes asking about what kind of fish this is. If you look in the original language, it just calls it a fish. We assume it was a whale. And people say, well, I've heard people have debates over whether it was really a whale or it was something else. You know, it's not relevant to the story. It's not a big fish. It's a big God, right? Who delivers. Who miraculously saves. What normally happens in commentaries even, in discussions, is people start trying to scientifically explain. You can't scientifically explain God. What kind of fish could a man live in for three days? The kind of fish that God allowed him to, right? Amen? Amen. Now John Piper said this is the wrong question. If you're, if you're asking how a man can survive in the belly of a fish for three days, the answer is he probably can't. Any more than a person can stay three days in the grave and live with it. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Our God, Yahweh, is a God who miraculously saves. The right response is to be in awe. What kind of God can preserve a man within a fish for three days? Sometimes... Sometimes God's work in our life is painful. Would anybody agree with that? Sometimes God's work in our life is, 
It's painful. God didn't let Jonah return to the shore because He knew it would almost take dying to break Jonah. Rest assured, God knows exactly what it will take to break you. Do you believe that tonight? Yeah. God knows exactly what it will take to break you as well. May we respond to God's gracious word and obedience. Not only is, is our God a God who relentlessly pursues and Yahweh a God who miraculously saves, but the third truth that we see from the book of Jonah is that Yahweh is a God who sovereignly forgives. Yahweh is a God who sovereignly forgives. And we see it at the end of chapter 2. It says, The Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. That just sounds all kinds of disgusting, right? <laughs> fish vomit. God spoke to the fish. If you can't stop and just be in awe of God saying, Fish, preserve Jonah. Fish, throw him up. And in an instant, He's vomited out of the dry land. I mean, that, how can you not just stand in awe of that? <clears throat> in the New Testament, it says, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey, right? Yahweh is a God who sovereignly forgives. In, in, this, in this miraculous story, it says, the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Listen to what he says. Sounds oddly familiar. Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against, the, against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. In breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. This miraculous story. God shows His sovereign right to show mercy to whoever He wants. These are a pagan people who have spit in the face of God. And then you see this display of God's power. He's chased down Jonah, sends him to Nineveh, and, Nineveh, and in Nineveh he gets there, and in the Hebrew he gets to preach five words. Hey, well, aren't y'all thinking right now, I wish this guy would stop talking and preach a five word sermon? <laughs> There's probably been many times you've thought, Hey, I wish our preacher would preach a five-word sermon. Jonah gets to come there and God displays His greatness and His power. This huge city. And Jonah says five words. He was there one day and the whole city repented. Isn't that God an awesome God? Amen? Amen? The whole city. I mean, what, could you think about what if formidable the whole city repented and turned to God. Believed and turned to God. So it was Nineveh. Way bigger. It was a display of God's power. And what we see is that Jonah, Jonah shows us that if God can work through a man like this and reach people such as this, then He can certainly use us, right? Right? Do we want to be used? Amen. God shows His power. Yahweh is a God who sovereignly forgives. Throughout time, God has spoken through rocks, through donkeys. I mean, don't you love the story of Balaam's, where Balaam's oracle and all that's going on and he's riding the donkey and the donkey basically tells him, here it is. How do you not see this? God is trying to deal with you. God uses whatever He wants. He even uses stubborn, rebellious prophets, and He can speak through us as well. Third truth is that Yahweh is a God who sovereignly forgives. And that leads us to truth number four. We see it in chapter four. Is that Yahweh is a God who infinitely loves. Yahweh is a God who infinitely loves. Now, I believe we could see this whole story right here. We could wrap it up. Said so that was a great story of God's power, God's protection, and God's provision of His people. But the story doesn't end. There's more to this story. And it says this, and I'm going to read chapter 4. It's a little long, but, but just bear with me. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, now, Jonah argued with the Lord, ran from the Lord, he chased him down, he was obedient, he comes and preaches. I get excited if one person comes to the Lord, right? 
Now, I'm not going to lie, I get excited if somebody says, I really enjoyed that sermon. The whole city repented and it said, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. And it's just, the man inside of me wants to say, Jonah, come on, dude. The whole city repented and turned to God and it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is this not what I said you were going to do? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat at the east of the city, and he made a booth there for himself, and he sat under the shade till he could see what would become of the city. And the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah so that it might be shamed over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. When the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to, live, to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are far more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also so much cattle? Yahweh is a God who infinitely loves Jonah has this anger, yet God shows compassion, right? Jonah's angry because all these... And, and it just it's crazy to read him saying that. I knew you were going to forgive me, God, because you're gracious and you're merciful. And it just makes you scratch your head. What was Jonah thinking? And then God teaches him a lesson. He's got this anger and hatred towards people, but God shows compassion with and for all people. He has his right to deliver the Assyrians, right? God has the right to destroy the plant, right? But Jonah questions him. And God answers. He says, you have pity for this plant. Which you did not labor. And you were only with it for one day. And a night it came to be. And then the night it was destroyed. How then, Jonah, could I not pity all these people that I have labored to create, 120,000 of them, and much more cattle. Yahweh is a God who infinitely loves. And we look at this, and we look at Jonah, and we say, that is crazy. But I submit to you tonight that there are people in our lives that we don't care for either. Right? Yeah. Right? The greatest thing that could happen in the presidential election or debate is not Hillary Clinton being shot. It's Hillary Clinton being saved. I've heard so many times in, in different settings where I'm walking around because I listen to everything for some reason. People saying, I hope she don't get elected. If she does, I hope somebody pops her. <laughs> Maybe somebody will shoot her. I mean, I've heard that multiple times, and you laugh, but you've probably heard it too. The greatest thing that could not happen, that could happen in this election, is not for her to be shot. It's for her to come face to face with an Almighty God who would bring her to the point of salvation. Amen. Amen. Yet we rail and despise that God keeps her alive. Yahweh is a God who relentlessly pursues. Yahweh is a God who miraculously <coughs> saves. Yahweh is a God who sovereignly forgives. And Yahweh is a God who infinitely loves. And now I want to ask you four questions and I want you to answer them honestly as you can. First question. Are you running from God? Have you ever been closer to God than you are right now? Are you running from Him? 
Maybe there's some call that you absolutely know that He has called you to do and you're running from it because you're scared. I may have told y'all this before. I've told some of y'all. If I've told y'all, I'm sorry you're going to have to hear it again. God called me to preach when I was 19 years old. Preached the first sermon I ever preached at Berean Baptist Church in Jonesville, Louisiana. Said everything that I had prepared for days to say in five minutes, three times. And I knew that there's no way as bad a job as I did that God could have called me to preach. And I took off. And I jumped on a boat. And I sailed from Tarshish. Are you running from God? God knows what it will take to break you. Turn to God. Turn to the God who relentlessly pursues. Second question. Do you trust in God for your salvation? Or do you trust in some act of your own volition? The saints of the Scriptures cry out, salvation belongs to the Lord. Yahweh is a God who miraculously saved. And I hate to break it to you, it has nothing to do with anything you've done. Only what He did. Third question, are you ashamed of the Gospel? Romans 1.16 is this, I'm unashamed of the Gospel, Paul says, it is the power of God and the salvation of the Jew first and then the Gentile. Everyone who believes. Unashamed of the gospel. Are we ashamed of the gospel? No, we say absolutely not. But how many times have we come up to a situation in our lives where we were ashamed? Where we had the opportunity to share the gospel and for whatever reason we made excuse after excuse not to proclaim it. Well, somebody else will do it. Well, that's not my job. I really don't like it. You don't want to admit to that one, but you've done it. Are we ashamed of the gospel? And if the answer truly is no, then why are we not sharing it with everyone we meet? Right? God has called you all to be missionaries, whether you like it or not, to go. And I love what Bodie Balkum says uh, about Matthew 28, where it says, Go ye therefore to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? Making disciples. And then he says, And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the earth, right? And, and every one of us likes to hear that, And lo, I'm going to be with you. But Bodie says it this way, If you don't get go ye therefore, you don't get lo, I'm with you. And I don't know about you, but, but I won't lo, I'm with you. That means I, I've got to get go ye therefore. He's not talking to just preachers, to just missionaries. He's talking to the saints. Now, now is everybody in here want to be a saint? Or, or you want to claim that one? To the call? To the brethren? Do you want to claim that one? Then you've got to get go ye therefore. If we're unashamed of the gospel, why aren't we sharing it? The fourth and last question that I want to ask you and I want you to really think about tonight is who really is serious in your life? Who are the Assyrians in your life? Who are a people that if you're just flat out honest with yourself, you despise? Who are those people that you have the hardest time caring about? Maybe it's some of your family. Maybe it's another race. Maybe it's somebody that you once were friends with. Or maybe it's somebody that you once were in church fellowship with. Who are the Assyrians in your life? What are you going to do about it? God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. God made Jonah go to Nineveh. God is compassionate. For all peoples. The gospel stories is how God loves His enemies and then calls them who have experienced this love to go tell others. You know, the book of John tells us that if we don't love, then we don't know God. Yahweh is a God who infinitely loves and He calls His people to be loving people. To care about the lost, the sick, the needy. 
calling us to seek out ways to share His compassion to others. One of the things that bothers me more than anything about the church today is sometimes I feel like we've lost the capacity to think outside of ourselves. And what's good for us. Francis Chan said one time that he was following up Christine Chan at Passion about he was hearing her, her experience and I just kept thinking that if it was one of his kids how he would want to go he would want to give he would want to chase he would want to go find whoever took his child and go after it God is calling us to have that same compassion towards all people the story in Jonah is not about a great fish. It's about a great God. A God that we should want this entire world to know about, right? We should want to tell the world that, that Jesus lives, right? Like the song by Hillsong, tell the world that Jesus lives. Tell the world that He, he died for them. Tell the world that Jesus lives. You know that's the difference in Christianity and all other religions, right? And our God still lives. Because He lives, we should live to tell others about Him. Would you stand, church? Heavenly Father, we come before you now. I don't know any other way to say it, but we just stand in awe of Your presence and all of Your majesty, Father, and all of Your forgiveness, Your salvation, Your mercy, Father, Your compassion. And Father, I just pray that You would make us a people with that same compassion. Father, oh, these questions that you posed to us tonight, Father, I just pray that we would answer them to ourselves honestly, Father, and that we would respond appropriately. Conviction without action is nothing, and it's worthless, just as we talked about this morning. Father, I pray that you do whatever it takes in my life, in the life of whoever else, to break us so that you can remake us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>